Yeah, I don't want I'm asked tonight to speak to you about confession. Um, but I know you're all in college and you know a lot more about confession than maybe like a, you know, anybody else. You should know a lot about it because supposedly you and I have been practicing it for a very long time throughout our life. So tonight I figured we could talk not so much about confession as really what it is, but actually how to prepare for it. Okay? As you know, um, with, as with anything in our lives, preparation usually makes the difference in almost everything. If you think about it, without preparation there won't be a favorable response or a favorable result. For example, if you have, for example, if you have, for example, if you're not preparing for like your MCATs or your SATs, what do you think you're going to get? Not such a good grade. If you don't prepare, for example, for somebody coming over, okay, your mom, you know how you went to your mom, she uh, this company, so you have to clean your room, and you have to clean the living room, and you have to sweep the garage out, and you have to do whatever you have to do, because there's a result that you need. So there's a lot of preparation. What about marriage, for example? I mean, as a priest, I learned one thing. Marriages are like the most important thing to us for some reason. You know, like we don't prepare for anything like we prepare for a marriage. And that's kind of disappointing sometimes because we, we, uh, we don't even really care so much about the actual liturgy of the marriage, but as the flowers and this and that. Imagine that if one of you girls decides to get married and you get married but you don't prepare at all. It'd be a disaster, right? Preparation is something that we do for everything in order, in order to have some sort of good result. And the same thing is for our, our confession, thank you, our confession and our repentance, okay? Reconciliation to God. And the reason why I'd like you to focus a little bit about preparation is because when you prepare for something, you respect it. When you prepare for an exam, you know the consequences. You know what it's going to do. If you prepare for God, for repentance, for confession, then what's going to happen is it's telling me that you have a mature understanding of what it is and that you respect God and you have some sort of responsibility for it. There's a, there's a, a level of understanding, you know? And we see this message of preparation even from the very beginning of the ministry of St. John the Baptist, okay? St. John the Baptist, he said in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3, you could read along with me, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, like two coats or two shirts or two whatever, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than... What is appointed for you? Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. I brought this passage up, if you, if you were following me, to kind of to kind of bring to you the idea that St. John the Baptist, when he was telling the people to prepare, he wasn't just telling the people to prepare mentally, <laughs> If you look at all, all the, the, the yellow words, all these are verbs. So when you prepare for something, you actually do something. You prepare, you do. So just like they asked, what should we do, St. John the Baptist, to prepare for the coming of the Lord, to prepare for my repentance, you have to ask yourself the same thing. What shall we do? How is it that you can prepare for, for confession? Shouldn't it be 
more than just sitting in the back of the church fooling around with your friends until Abuna's ready? Shouldn't it be more than just when you see Abuna, you give him a big high five and you know, and you say, you know, you just joke around and you sit and you're just laughing the whole confession? Last, I haven't seen tears in confession in years. And I don't understand why. Confession is something huge, which tells me that there is no preparation going on before the person comes. And it's taken just so, so lightly. They asked him. He said to them, prepare the way. Make straight the way of the Lord. And then they asked him a question. What shall we do? What shall we do? The soldiers, what shall we do? Don't intimidate anybody. The tax collectors, what shall we do? Don't take more money than you're supposed to. Um, and all the other stuff that you see up there. What shall we, eh, what shall we do? So, I'm hopefully, by God's grace, if you pray enough for me, God's grace, we can all learn something tonight, a little bit deeper understanding of the idea of preparing for confession. Okay, I'm going to get into the confession and what it is and all that at the end, just as a, like a conclusion. But I really want to focus all of my effort on this idea of preparing for it. In order to prepare for it, okay, you, you got to understand what it actually is. Okay? You have to understand what it is. So we're going to speak about what repentance is and the process of it. Okay? And then we're going to go into the preparation for it. Okay? Repentance is a commandment. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? He also says, unless you repent, you shall all hmm, likewise perish. You shall all likewise perish. Okay? I'm trying to give you an understanding of what repentance is. Okay? St. Paul the Apostle says, Now then, we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we beg you, we implore you, be on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So repentance is a reconciliation. If I'm upset with Danny, okay, there is no, there's nothing between us. There's a big wall, and I hate him, and he hates me, and I don't want to see his face. But when I reconcile with him, I tear down that wall. So repentance means that you are coming face to face with the Almighty, and you're reconciling with him. It's not a matter of just sitting with Abuna and getting it over because your parents are on your case or you just want to, you know, appease your, your, your conscience that, you know, oh, okay, I did my duty, I just want to confess really quick and no preparation, no nothing, just let me just do this quick, 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 quick. And I know that a lot of us don't have a good understanding of how to prepare for repentance or how to prepare for the sacrament of confession. And if I, if I seem like I'm harsh, just accept my apology from now. Because I'm not, I don't mean to. Sometimes I just get a little bit overworked because these things are so simple, such simple concepts that we really should have a good understanding of. You know, if you're a pharmacist, you have a good understanding of pharmacology. If you're an accountant, you have a good understanding of the accounting laws. If you don't, you're a miserable pharmacist and you're a miserable accountant. Okay? So if we don't have a, a good understanding of our own faith and the practices that we practice on a, on a monthly, bi-monthly basis, then something's wrong with us. Then we become not such good Christians, right? So reconciliation. Let's see what the next one says. Ezekiel the prophet says, Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from all, cast from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. A new heart and a new spirit. When you go to confession, do you get a new heart? Do you get a new spirit? Is this, this, is this how you feel? Or you walk in, like everybody tells me, Abuna, I don't feel any better when I walk out. And I'll, tell, I'll answer that question for you after, towards the end. Look at what St. Ignatius of Antioch says. <clears throat> Repentance is finding our way back to God. The shepherd of Hermas, 
first, second century document, says, do you not realize that repentance is understanding? To repent is to understand. For the sinner understands that he has done wickedly before the Lord. To do wickedness, you have to understand that you're committing this wickedness not against just yourself, not against maybe just your fellow human, but also, the most important, against Him, against God Himself. This is sometimes we, we, we're anesthetized because we feel like sin is just part of our lives now. If I were to ask you, do you think fish know that they're wet when they're swimming around in the ocean, the bottom of the ocean? Do they, do they know that they're wet? No. They don't know that they're wet. Why? Why don't they know that they're wet? Because what? Because they're in it all the time. Because they're fish. Because what? They're fish. Because they're fish, okay. <laughs> okay, that's good too, but it just ruined my whole example. <laughs> you guys understand what I mean, right? The fish don't realize, they don't realize that there's actually something called dry because what? They're always wet. But they don't realize that they're always wet, so they think that's what it is. The Old Testament says there's going to come a time when we sin so often, as often as it becomes like drinking water. How many times do you have a bottle in your hand? How many times do you sip water every day? A lot. The Bible's telling us that we're going to get to that point because we don't understand that what the evil we do and what and how it affects us, our fellow Man and our God, and that it's an offense to God. Okay? Look at what the Psalms say. This is, this is our attitude, should be. Unrighteousness have I hated and abhorred. Abhorred. I abhor it. This is repentance. When I look to the sin and not looking at it to do it, but looking at it with disgust, looking at it that I hate this thing looking at it like as my enemy, not as something that we're buddy-buddy and, you know, okay, I'll just put you off a little bit because it's Holy Week, you know, or we're in the Great Lent, or you know what, um, I have a big exam next week, so I need like, you know, God, I need you a little bit, so I'll kind of appease you, but right after the exam, I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> this is what we do, whether consciously or unconsciously. This is what we do. St. John Chrysostom says, Repentance consists of no longer doing the same things. For, th for he who returns to the same sins is like a person who pours water into a container full of holes. Okay? So he's saying here, not returning. Okay? Look at what St. John Sabbath says. Okay? Look what he says. Repentance saves and releases those whom the devil has what? Captured. Okay? You can think of repentance as a key to your freedom from the devil. You take any sort of, of sin. Any sort of sin. There's always this habitual aspect of the sin. Whether it's cursing, whether it's lying, whether it's of a sexual nature, whatever it is, there's always this habitual part of it. And that's what the devil uses to chain us. Okay, so he's saying here, repentance saves and releases those whom the devil has captured. Look at this next one. Many years of the devil's hard work is lost in one moment of repentance. Wow. So you can foil the plan of the devil just by offering a true repentance. All his life, he's working to make you go to hell and me. He's trying to destroy you and me. He's not your friend. He's your enemy. Okay? But we're very buddy-buddy with him. Okay? And as long as we're buddy-buddy, we sit in the As long as we do what he asks us to do, hey, we're on the good side. But once I decide to repent, he starts his battles. But he, because he knows 
that once I do, all I got to do is really repent and everything that he's been working since the day I was born till this very moment is gone, is ruined. Okay? My, I have an opinion. I never really heard it anywhere or read it. So it's my personal opinion. Okay? It's not a church teaching. But you know how um, the church teaches us that we have guardian angels? The, the Bible, of course, tells us that. And then the church teaches us that on the day of our baptism, we receive the guardian angel, right? I also think, just I was thinking about this, I think that we receive a guardian devil as well, okay? Who is there constantly fighting you. And he knows, like, what does he do to a little kid that's like three months old? Nothing. All he does is sit back and observe. He's trying to figure out who you are. Are you a quiet person? Or are you one of those hotheads? Because if you're a hothead, it'll be easier for him to use you and to abuse you and to get you to fall in certain sins. And as you grow, he's there. He's watching. He's observing because he has so much experience. If you have an addictive personality, oh, you know what he's going to throw your way? All the addictive substances. He's going to throw them right in your face. If you're not into that, he'll get you with like pride. He'll get you with anger. He'll get you with all sorts of different types of things. That's what he does. Okay? But you can ruin his plan just by repenting. Just by saying, you know what? No. That's it. I'm walking away from this. It's done. I'm done with this. Look, this one, as the next one is my, my favorite saying about repentance. Take a look at it and remember it in the deepest, darkest times when you and I fall into sin. Look what it says. Repentance transforms adulterers back into what? Virgins. Talk about hope. Talk about beauty. Talk about power. Repentance can transform me from an adulterer, a fornicator, into a virgin again. Not so much physically, but spiritually, of course. Look what else he says. He's personifying repentance now. He says, Who does not love you, O repentance? You who carry all the blessings. O mother of forgiveness. Intercessor for sinners. And key to the kingdom. It's a wonderful thing. If you understand what repentance means, and you strive for it, wow, you'll be the freest, the most powerful, the most joyful, calm person ever. Look at what St. Isaac the Syrian says. Repentance is the door of mercy open to those who what? Who seek it. Okay? It's a door that you have to seek. It doesn't come flying in your face and hit you in your face. You actually have to do it. Okay? There's actually something called effort. Okay? Which we're not, none of us are really used to doing these days especially toward God. His Holiness of Thrice Blessed Memory. Repentance is the return of the person to himself. The return of the heart to God. That's in his book, Life of Repentance and Purity. I would uh, suggest that you all read it about 25 times. Okay? It's one of the best books that His Holiness has ever written. That one and <coughs> Diabolic Wars. Because it explains to you how the devil actually works against you. He uses like his experience in warfare with the devil to actually share with us the secrets of how we can overcome the devil and what he does in all of his tricks. St. Ephraim the Syrian, he says, Cry out, O sinner, with all your might. Spare not your voice, your throat, for your Lord is merciful and loves those who repent. As soon as you return, your Father will come out to meet you and to rejoice. When you repent, God of heaven comes to you. You don't have to go anywhere. He comes to you. Just like the prodigal son and the father. The father was there all the time, looking and watching and waiting. The moment he saw him, he ran to him. And it says, I, 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 maybe I mentioned this to you before, 
some of you. He ran and he, it said he fell on his neck. Anybody know what that means? When you fall on somebody's neck? So what, he's on the ground and I just trip on him? Like, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> what does falling on his neck mean? Hmm? Would you care to demonstrate? Mike, come here. <clears throat> come here. Okay? He's, he's the prodigal <laughs> and I'm, I'm the father. Okay? So we'll go like this. This is, when he saw him, this is what he did. This is what he did. He fell on his neck at oops. <laughs> and he, he was able to kiss him from the back of the neck. Because it's so in, so close. That's what it meant by he fell on his neck. Thank you. Yes, you can. <laughs> you get the idea? You get the idea? So through repentance, your heavenly father will come to you and fall on your neck. He will give you the closest and the tightest hug that is ever possible for you. So, let's summarize what we just, okay, no, let's not. Origin the scholar. He says, through repentance, the sinner bathes his bed in tears and his tears become his bread by day and night. Not ashamed to show his sin to the priest of the Lord and ask for the remedy. Okay, when you repent, you receive a remedy. Okay, so now let's summarize what we just said about all of this. Okay, so if repentance is a commandment and a warning, reconciliation with God, turning and casting away from sin, new heart, a new spirit, finding the way back to God, understanding, ceasing to do the old, releasing the chains of sin, foils the devil's plans, transformation occurs, carrier of all blessing, the mother of forgiveness, intercessor of sinners, key to the kingdom, door of mercy, meeting with the Father, and a remedy. My question to you, kind of corny, but isn't it worth preparing for? Remember how I talked to you in the beginning about what repentance, um, sorry, what the value of preparing for something is? When you prepare for something, it shows me that you respect it, that you're mature, and that you have a good understanding. So when you go to confession next time, keep all of these points in mind. All of these points. 18 points in mind. Okay? Think about it and prepare properly. You'll be a different person every time you come. Every time you leave, you'll be renewed, you'll be restored, and you'll be soaring up into the kingdom. Every time, while, you're, while your feet are flat on the ground, you'll be up there. It is possible. The saints do it all the time. Okay? And it only comes about with a lot of sweat and blood, a lot of hard work, a lot of effort. The Bible says to us, what a man sows, what you plant, is what you will reap or what you will harvest. So if you plant a lot, you put a lot of effort into your spiritual life, you're going to get back beautiful fruits, many beautiful things. Okay. So, sometimes, be yes? No, I, forget about confession. Confession is a function of the mouth. Repentance is a function of the heart. Repentance is the work that you have to do before you even call a boon or text him and say, I need to see you. You have to understand all of this first. Okay? And then I'm going to go through the process now of how you can prepare. And I'm just talking strictly about repentance. Okay? Confession has nothing to do with the priest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Repentance has nothing to do with the priest. The repentance is between you and God. That's where you do all your crying. That's where you do your matanyas. That's where you afflict yourself. That's where you beat your chest. That's where you slap your head. That's you do all these things. Yes, yes, we're supposed to. We should. We take this very lightly. Sin against God is extremely, extremely, extremely severe. You know, if I, if I uh, smack a little kid, right? It's different than if I smack a teenager. Different than if I punch one of you guys or punch... <laughs> Uncle Misha, oh, I wouldn't. He taught me, by the way. Oh, I knew this one punch. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going anywhere. 
<laughs> or, or if you if you if you offend, if you offend, for example, the police commissioner, or the mayor, or the governor, or the president. So I can do the same thing against all of these people that I just mentioned. But the offense is greater, not based on what I did, but based on who it is that I'm doing it against. You got it? You understand that? Yes? Are you alive? Are you awake? Huh? You get the idea? So when we sin, we don't realize that we're slapping the Almighty right in the face. We don't get that. We just think, oh, it's just another lie, just another look, just another dollar I stole, just another whatever. We don't understand. So when you repent, Habib, you got to first repent. You got to first understand. Okay? I could, just, I could have just come here tonight and just talked to you about how to confess and what to say and what not to say and when to come and do that and, and that's it. No, I, I figured, you know what, you guys are mature, you're all in college now. And, you know, although I still don't believe that uh, Philip's in college. <laughs> Hi, Philip. <laughs> Love him. So you're all in college. You're all in college. You should understand a little bit more than just, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to say to Abuna, I lied, I stole, I, I beat up my brother, and I, I disrespected my parents. Is that, is that a confession? Is that a repentance? That's nothing. You're... you're you're fooling yourselves and you're fooling God and you're wasting your time. If you don't have any of these things in your heart when you're actually preparing. So because we don't understand, because we underestimate the power of sin, because we're used to this heartless, thoughtless ret uh, uh, routine, we're not serious about God's commandments, because we take communion in an unworthy way because it's so, wor so easily given, Okay, it would be different if I was in charge. Because we conform to the world so much, because, 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 we never prepare properly for repentance, or we don't, know how to pre we don't know how to prepare for confession by giving a true repentance. And when we don't prepare, this is why, what I'm about to say, this is why some people, when they go into confession, they leave as if they never confessed. There's no benefit. There's no growth, there's no joy, there's no change, and there's no life. I go in thinking something, and I come out, I'm still dead. There's no difference in me. This is a disaster. This is a disaster. It's the biggest disaster that we suffer from in the Coptic Orthodox Church. We have a lot of them, but this one is the biggest one. Okay? This is the biggest one. Because confession or repentance, the sacrament of reconciliation, should be a life-changing experience every time you sit with your spiritual father. It should be a springboard of newness and growth and new life. But it actually becomes a, 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 a time, a setting where you point fingers Okay? I know what you guys say to each other. Okay? You guys, some people say this. You know, I, I, don't, I don't get anything out of confession. I go to Boone and I say the same thing. He gives me the same advice every single time. And it's just, you know what, I'm going to go find somebody else. You know, oh, he's a cool Abuna. Oh, he's a good one. He's a What's wrong in that picture? What's wrong is that you're throwing the responsibility on the spiritual father. Yeah, there is a responsibility. The spiritual father, and I'll talk about this, I'm jumping ahead, but he's supposed to know how to counsel you spiritually. He should be a spirit bearer. He should be full of the spirit. Okay? And he has a responsibility to look after you and to help you and to be in touch with you. But you have the bigger burden. You're the one that has to do all the work all the sweat and blood of the repentance. You're the one that has to follow up or follow through after you leave there. You just don't go. It's like Abu Nishnu, the God rest his soul. Um, he said to us, the priest is like a garbage can. People come with their garbage and they just dump in on him 
and they leave to go get more. And they dump back. <laughs> when it's supposed to be, he, you dump, right? And then you leave, but you don't put anything else back in there. Okay? That's what it's supposed to be. So there's not, none of this joy, none of this change, none of this life, nothing. Because we don't have any clue what this is. We don't know what we're doing. The biggest disaster in the world. Okay? The biggest disaster in the world. So, let's dive a little bit deeper, okay? And try to prevent this disaster from continuing in your life and in my life. I want to talk about three, three aspects of repentance. Three aspects of repentance. The first aspect of repentance is something called contrition. Contrition. What is contrition? It's a sincere and complete remorse. Meaning you regret with such a sense of guilt for the sins that I have committed. It actually comes, if those of you guys who are interested in all that stuff, um, it comes from the Latin contritus, which means to ground it to pieces. So when I have a contrite heart, a humble and broken, or humble and contrite heart, uh, if I could illustrate, I could take my heart out and crush it and present it to God. That's the first, that's the first aspect of repentance. And this is why, my beloved, this is why we, don't, we go into confession and we come out of confession the same. Because we have no remorse. We have no regret. We have no sense that we even did something wrong. That's the disaster. That's what I'm talking about. This contrition, by the way, only comes to those who are truly the children of God because it proceeds from their love for God. See, you can't just go and put sackcloth on and ashes, okay, and beat your chest and slap your face and all that stuff that some of our parents do, right? An act. It's not an act. Because you stand before God naked. He sees, you, he sees through you. What is the condition of your heart when you enter into the room with Abuna? What is it? Is there any, any contrition whatsoever? So you have to enter into it. And I'm going to tell you later, after we go to the three aspects, through the three aspects, I'm going to tell you how, by God's grace, how you can really get this sense and really start your way, baby steps, onto a true repentance. Maybe... For some of us, including myself, the first time in my life. Okay? All right, so that, the first thing is contrition. Okay? And let me just say something before I go on. Contrition, you should feel it very deeply. Okay? But it shouldn't just manifest in tears and groanings and slappings and beating chests. It shouldn't just manifest. It could be part of that. Okay? But that, I don't like anything outer. I don't like any external things because that, that kind of tends to draw, uh, draw the prideful people, the, the actors in us, towards something like that. Because when you do that, you get attention. Who doesn't like to have attention from people? We all like to have attention. Okay? So it's better to slap yourself, to beat your chest, and to cry from your heart rather than do it externally when your heart is like, hey, this is cool. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Okay? So, what is it? It's when you have a, a, a contrite heart, it's an internal will of your heart to hate the sin. It is a wishing that the sin never occurred. And in your heart, you resolve, you determine that you will never commit the sin again. This is why St. John Chrysostom says, groan, groan after you have sinned. Not because you are to be punished, for this is nothing, but because you have offended your master. One so gentle, one so kind, one who loves you so much, and longs for your salvation as to have given even His Son for you 
on account of this, groan. On account of this, have a contrite heart. On account of this, take your heart out of your, of your body, if you could, and just crush it and throw it in front of God and say, Lord, this is what I am. I'm nothing. Take it from me, heal it, put it back together, and put it back in. Because you're the only one that can do that. The only one. Nobody else can do that except him. Not even the best surgeon. Not even the best psychologist. Not even the best priest, or bishop, or pope. You have to do that work. You have to pull it out, crush it, and then God will heal it and put it back together. Okay? We put too much hope and too much, um, too much focus and attention on the person that you're confessing to. I'll tell you a secret. The priest is just like a pen. Okay? He's a vessel. Okay? It doesn't matter which one. Okay? But you're the one that has to do the work. Okay? You've got to groan. You have to groan. When was the last time you groaned? After you, after you went to the China buffet down the road? <laughs> right? That's, what, that's when I go, and that's why I don't eat Chinese anymore. I haven't eaten Chinese in probably like five, ten years. No Chinese, no more. Not even a, a dumpling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, groan, guys, groan. Let me ask you a question. When the prodigal son, remember the prodigal son? Anybody know what prodigal means, by the way? Huh? Lost? Nope. Huh? Okay. Huh? What else? I'm, I'm going to tell you the right answer. Yeah. Wasteful, wasteful, lost. What else? What does prodigal mean? You've been hearing it since you were in kindergarten. Huh? Rebellious. No. <laughs> it actually means wasteful. It actually means wasteful. So let me ask you a question. When the prodigal son, the wasteful son, decided to return back to his father's house, what was he worried about? Somebody answer this question. Think about it first. Think about it. When the prodigal son decided to return to his father's house, what was he worried about? What was he worried about? Yes, Philip. Very good. Was he worried about, is he going to get his, his inheritance back? Is he going to get his old room back? Is he going to go be able to pet the cows like he used to before? Is he going to be able to hang out with his brother in his room? Is he, was he able to go into the kitchen and just open the fridge and say, it's a full fridge, and say, Ma, what's there to eat? Well, Habibi, it's full. Take what you want. The pantry's packed. I'm hungry. There's nothing to eat. Right? Was that what he was worried about? He was worried about being accepted back by his father. That's why his repentance was a true repentance. That's why, that's why he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay? Remember the parable of the publican and the Pharisee? Remember that? Let's read a little bit. In Luke chapter 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. I am not like any other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes, 10% of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's two types of people in this parable. This is why the Lord said it. He was speaking, this is a parable, Okay, so this was a story that the Lord made up to teach. And because he was speaking, if you read St. Luke's Gospel, you'll find or the, or the, the chapter before, he's talking to people that are very self-righteous. I can do no wrong. 
And then you have another person who's humble. So what type of person are you? What type of confession, confess, uh, confessee are you? What type, of, what type of attitude do you have? Do you have the attitude of this guy? Beat his chest. I'm great. I'm better than him. I'm better than her. I'm better than him. And I'm even better than Abuna. I don't need to confess, but you know, I'm just going to go. Abuna, I fast twice a week. Come on, man. I fast. <laughs> what am talking about? What college student fasts twice a week? Come on. You know what I mean? I, I cheat every once in a while. I go to Subway and get the tuna with the mayo, but, you know, but that's still fasting. <laughs> right? Come on. I give 10% I give of my $3 allowance that I get. Come on. Come on. The Pharisee, is that the type of person you are? The Pharisee? Self-righteous? Attitude of judgment of others? Never focusing on yourself? Expects forgiveness from the priest and thinks he's perfect. What if I ever say to you, I'm not going to give you absolution. I'm not going to forgive you your sin. What would you do? You'd go, go to the bishop and complain, right? You'd think that this would be like, a, like we're running a company here. I'm going to go to your supervisor. Where's, who's your manager? <laughs> what is that? The Lord gave the authority to bind and to? To bind and to? Loose. loose. Okay, what does that mean? If I loosen the sin, if the priest loosens the sin, then it is lo loosed. It's gone. It's done. But if I bind it on you, it's not forgiven. St. John Chrysostom says in his book on the priesthood that the priesthood, the authority of the priesthood is so great to the point that whatever the priest says on earth, it is ratified in heaven by God. Wow. So I could easily say to any of you, no. And? Pardon? A millionaire? A millionaire. What does that have to do with this? I, I, it went over my head. It went over, overhead my, my emma. Maybe I need to take it off then. I don't understand. Sorry. Are you like this guy? Or? Or, are you like the tax collector? You with me? Humble guy. Knows how filthy and sinful he is. Throws himself at the mercy of God. Which type are you? Answer that to your, for yourself, guys. Hmm? Answer that for yourself. What type of person are you? Which one are you? The one that expects the forgiveness? Or the one that says, I don't deserve this. The one that intends to do the sin over and over and over and over and over again because it's so easy and this is a disaster I was talking about before because I have no clue what repentance means and this wonderful confession, the mystery of confession. You know some priests, when they, when they take confessions, I do this sometimes. I, use, I, I wear my sadreya. You know what the sadreya is? It's that liturgical garment that just goes around my neck and goes to the back of my back here and then down. It's a sacrament. We're actually, it's a sacrament. Okay? We should even practice it standing up. Okay? It's a sacrament. Sometimes I wear it. When it's next to me, I wear it. You know, we gotta like, we gotta understand how, how reverent this, 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 this activity we do is. Okay? All right. So, so far, uh, again, I'm trying to, if I lost you, I'm trying to get you to understand what repentance is and how to repent. And I told you the first point is contrition. You have to have a contrite heart, that broken, crushed heart. The second thing you have to have is an afflicted heart. What is afflicted? It's close to contrition. It's a sorrow of the heart, a persistent pain or distress of the heart. It's like a great suffering, agony, anguish, or torment. Okay? It comes out not so much out of the love of God, like contrition does, but it comes out of the fear of God and His punishment. And unfortunately, some of us don't even know what the fear of God is. My prayer always is to increase our love for you, our knowledge of you, and our fear of you. We have to learn how to fear God. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke four times more about hell 
than he did about heaven in the New Testament. Did you know that? He says, fear him who after he has killed has the authority to throw into hell. Fear him. So this affliction, this afflicted heart, this second aspect of repentance comes from the fear of God that you and I should have. The fear of God. You and I should be very afraid of God. Okay? Realizing that the reality of the state of the sin has caused, like, I'm in this, like, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm addicted. Oh my Lord. I have to realize the reality of what's going on in my life. For whatever it is that I'm addicted to, TV, coffee, sexual things, uh, drugs, uh, cigarette, whatever. I have to realize, it. oh my goodness, I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm in a, the, the most sorry state in the world. What in the world is going on with me? Okay? Examples? Adam and Eve. Think of how afflicted they must have, have felt. Remember? They were enjoying it. No work except to tend the garden. No mortgage to pay. Nothing to plant. No clothes to go buy at Macy's or look for sales. Nothing. All they had to do is just stay away from that one tree. And then after the disaster of what they did, what happened? They left. They got kicked out. Imagine what type of affliction. This is the type of affliction that I'm trying to make you understand what should be a part of your repentance. That you should have this aff afflicted, agonizing heart. How can I get myself into this situation that I'm in? We were in the Garden of Eden, Eden and we were able even to speak with God. And now look at me. I'm wearing some animal skins. The ground is giving me thorns and thistles. I have to work by the sweat of my brow. And me, Eve, I have to scream when I give a, a birth to a child and I have to obey my husband and, and be subject to him now. What is this? Affliction, affliction. What about David? The David, the great Psalm, Psalm 50. Have mercy on me. Why? Because he realized his sin and that's why God accepted his repentance because he was afflicted he had a broken heart because he knew what he did with Bathsheba was an abomination in the sight of the Lord what about St. Peter the Apostle he bitterly wept bitterly bitter you know when you cry it's because of, oh. <laughs> or you could cry when you're screaming and crying and you feel pain. That's what he did. He was afflicted. That's why the Lord accepted his repentance like that. Affliction. Yes, Peter. Um, when King David fell into sin, uh, he did not realize it until the like, was prophet and like, he was, So sometimes... My question is, like, sometimes is it, like, does God realize that when you sin, for example, you don't realize that you're supposed to send somebody to wake you up? And so it's not always expected to come. Because what we're saying is when you sin, you should feel the affliction. But sometimes, like, you know, it's a month or whatever, you know, it's just like, God, I just love you, whatever, but, like, you know, you send someone to wake you up, and is that still as acceptable? Absolutely. Absolutely. He does that out of His love for us. And you could probably think to yourself how many times the Lord would send somebody or something, some, something your way to wake you up from what you've been doing. It's happened to you, right? It's happened to you. It's definitely happened to me a lot. Yes, Peter. So then if nothing gets out our way, would we be acquitted of like sin? Absolutely not. Because you weren't supposed to get to that point in the first place. It's out of, your, out of, out of, my, own, out of my own spiritual negligence and disobedience that led me to that. Look, God did everything He could to save us. The ball now is in your court. He did everything. He showed you the way. He gave you His Word. He built His church on His blood and on our faith. He sent us bi bishops, priests, popes, parents. 
He gave us the sacraments. He gave us everything. And now, you have to do something. So, like His Holiness of Thrice Blessed Memories to say, look, if you can't repent, scream out to God and say, God, help me to repent so that I may repent. Because if you're not going to and you're just going to leave me, I'm going to be destroyed. See the, see the mature understanding of, of our sinful nature, or our sinful state, I should say. All right. What's the third thing? So, so far we did, the first one was contrition. Okay, this is how to, or what are the aspects of a true repentance. Contrition, and then affliction. Third, satisfaction. What does that mean? Satisfaction means that there's a reconciliation that has happened between the penitent, you and me, and God, through the fulfillment of our canon, our spiritual rule, okay? An actual completion or fulfillment of the rule assigned by the spiritual father, not with the intent to satisfy divine righteousness, okay? But the intent to discipline myself. God bless you, baby. Take care. Not with the intent to satisfy divine righteousness, because that was all satisfied on the cross. I'm talking about when, when the priest gives you, let's say he gives you like a few matanyas, right? Say so 35 matanyas in the morning and 35 at night. Is that going to get your forgiveness of sin? Yes or no? Absolutely not. It's not going to get you the forgiveness. Your forgiveness was already accomplished on the cross, which you have to... Um, participate in through the church, through your repentance, through the absolution, through the communion. But these spiritual rules or the spiritual canon or the spiritual exercise is given for your benefit, your strengthening. So when Abuna says to you, you're going to fast. And you know what? You're going to fast and you're not going to eat until 3 o'clock. What is he? He just what, wants to save you some money? What? what? <laughs> he wants to save your mom from like uh, cooking breakfast or something for you? No. He wants you to, train, to be able to be trained. You've got to train your body. So satisfaction, the third part of repentance, is when it has a lot to do with the canon, the rule that you receive. It's a spiritual exercise for the soul. The ability, and what does it cause you to do? This is the whole idea of, of the satisfaction or of the rule. This is the whole idea, this point right here. The ability through the rule, fulfilling of the rule, and this exercise, a spiritual exercise, to shake off the burden of sin and to proceed toward purification and deliverance from passions. To be free. So when you, for example, when you, let's say I'm struggling with a lot of lustful issues, okay? We know that the lustful issues, the source is the body, okay? So what do I need to do? I need to do what the monks and the saints and the Bible taught us. Etab elibitebek. Trouble that which gives you trouble. How are you going to trouble your body? Beat it. What are you going to do? Punch it. What are you going to do? You're going to afflict it. You're going to say, you know what? You want to eat? Absolutely not. I'm not going to let you eat. You want to sleep five, six, uh, ten hours? No. You're going to sleep only six or five, or maybe even four. You want rest? You know what? You get up right now and you're going to drop 20 matanyas. You, it, you're in a battle. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the whole philosophy, the whole idea behind the rule, behind the canon, the spiritual canon. Some ideas of spiritual canon, really quickly. Fasting, prayer, Holy Bible, almsgiving, prostrations, abstinence from communion. Okay? Abstinence or actually being forbidden to take communion. Okay? And service to others. What happens here? Some people, uh, some examples of people who were disciplined, and because of the discipline that was given to them, they were saved. Miriam, the sister of Moses, right? She was expelled out of the, the camp for, I think, seven days. And if it wasn't for the expulsion, she wouldn't have been saved. God would have destroyed her. So it's that casting out, okay? The fornicator in Corinth. St. Paul says, cut him off and give him to Satan. Okay? That he may be saved. 
Okay? That he may be saved. David the king, he was expelled by his own son and cursed and stoned by Shimei. And that's why God accepted his repentance. Okay, Habib? Keeping the rule, your canon, is the genuine proof that you're truly repenting. Uh, Abuna, I go to Atlantic City and I, you know, I drop about 500 bucks every time I go. And I'm coming to confess. I really, really, you know, I feel bad. Okay? So Abuna says, okay, my son, he explains what commandment did he break. He sits there with him and he talks to him about the, the sin and the evil that could happen there and around him. And he gives him the whole thing. And then at the end he says, you're not allowed to go again. What? What do you mean I'm not allowed to go again? Huh? What, why? Why not? What? Are you, are you serious here? I mean, <laughs> didn't you just, aren't you sitting with me here because you've offered a repentance to God that you've committed a, a big sin by going to Atlantic City and gambling and breaking the Tenth Commandment and many other commandments by your gambling? And I'm just telling you, uh, don't go back again. And the guy's in an uproar. I'm like, that absolution that I just gave you is useless. The absolution, by the way, don't think it's like abracadabra. If I just put my, my cross on your head and in your heart, you're just like that guy. You know, I'm going to go back. What is this? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Then you're not absolved for that sin. Hello? You're not absolved for that sin. You have to have a repentant, contrite, afflicted heart. And to truly prove it, you have to take steps not to do it again. You have a girlfriend. You have a boyfriend. And there's a lot of lachbata going on. Right? And you come to Abuna. And you repent. Supposedly. And you say, oh this and oh that. And oh, and I'm sorry, but we did this. No, don't worry, my son. Here's the dangers. These are the commandments that you broke. Uh, really big sin. This is the sin of the body. It's... You know, Buna sits there patiently explaining it, okay? And then, at the end, I say to the guy or the girl, don't see him again. Don't see her again. What? What do you mean? It's not a true repentance. I have no clue what they just did. This is the disaster I was talking to you about previously. This is the disaster. You have to be genuine. And when you are doing these, okay? an abstinence from Atlantic City and this other person, then what happens? You're proving to God. You're saying to Him, you know what? Okay, I stole something. You know what I tell the people that steal? Okay, I tell them. If they can't give it, I say give it back. If they can't give it back, what do I say? I tell them, look, you got to estimate the value, okay? And you got to take it and put it in the church. What do you mean? I got to do that. You're really genuine about your repentance, then you have to do something about it. Remember, St. John the Baptist? Prepare the way of the Lord. The tax collectors asked him, What should we do? The soldiers asked him, What should we do? The people asked him, What should we do? When you come to the priest and you say, Abuna, I did this and this and this, I'm going to tell you what to do. You should ask, What should I do to stop this sin? Remember what the Lord said. If your eye causes you to sin, what? Pluck it out. Why didn't he say, shut your eye? Because you could open it. Why didn't he? And he picked the most, the most sensitive of the senses. If you didn't hear, you wouldn't need Tylenol after this meeting for hearing me. Okay? It's not a big deal. You can get through your life. If you didn't eat, you'd be a lot skinnier. Okay? If you, didn't, you couldn't touch, okay. But if you can't see, that's a big issue. But he, he picked that sense. And he said, if your eye caused you to sin, grab it, take this sharp object, stab your eye, pull it out, pluck it out, and throw it away from you. That's what he said. That's what he meant. Which means, not something literally, but if this computer is, is my, my, my downfall, I'm going to take it. 
and I'm going to do something to it so that it's not my downfall anymore. Put a filter on it, uh, make a rule that I'm not going to go into the, my, my bedroom with, with, my, uh, with my computer. I'm going uh, uh, to take the door off of my room. Okay, do something. That's what it means by pluck the eye out. You got to be genuine, Habibi, when you do these things. This is the third aspect of your repentance. And this is what gives you joy. You with me, guys? Please say you're with me. Please, because this is why we don't have any joy. When you, don't confess, when you confess, but you don't have a contrite heart, an afflicted heart, and a satisfied heart, this is the part when you're actually struggling. And you're being, I don't want to use the word punished, you're being trained through all of these things. Then you start breathing again. Your heart that was dead now starts to eh, slowly come back to life. Slowly start beating. Next thing you know, it's going to get better and better and better. And you're going to get back into it. This is what makes a person satisfied. Yes? Um, I just have a question about the abstinence and communion. Yes. Like, It really depends. It really depends on the sin itself, the state of the sinner. How many times has this person done it before or not? And their attitude. Okay? Uh, that's one aspect. Uh, there really isn't too much room to interpret 1 Corinthians 11.28. 1 Corinthians 11.28 says... Do not approach the communion in an unworthy way. Because if you eat and drink the body and blood in an unworthy, I'm quoting, in an unworthy manner, you eat and drink damnation to yourself, not discerning the Lord's body. And then it says, this is why some of you are sick and some of you sleep. What is the sleep he's talking about here? Death. death. Not physical death, the spiritual death. This is it. So, so it really, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one basis. One-on-one. -on -one. If somebody comes to me and says, you know, this is my second abortion. No communion for at least five years. At least. At least five years. And I'm being very lenient. The church, years ago, centuries ago, 25 years no communion for somebody who commits an abortion. Man and woman. You're killing. You've just murdered somebody. But you think you have pro-choice. It's my body. I could do whatever I want. What is that? But yet, the same people that have pro-choice, by the way, right, are the ones that are animal activists, right? If you, if you, just, if you just kill one of those, those little pandas, they'll burn you alive. <laughs> right? Isn't it, isn't it true? But yet... But yet, if you kill a human being, it's pro-choice. It's my choice. It's my body. Get the heck out of here. Don't tell me what to do with my body. No. Yours, you're not your body. This, this body is not yours. And especially that little kid inside of you is not yours. Seriously. It's the biggest contradiction ever that I've ever seen. The people that are all pro-choice, these feminists, these people that are violently for the, pro the abortion, are also the animal activists that'll chop your head off if you just like, if you like squish like a, a spider or something. Makes no sense. So to answer your question, it has to, it, it has to be taken case by case. Okay, but, but the most important thing for you guys is when you go to, conf when you go, I'm sorry, when you go to communion, you have to be worthily partaking, which means Worthily partaking communion means you have to have faith that that actual bread and wine is true body, true blood. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you have to be in a state of grace, meaning that you have to be struggling against sin. Unworthy or worthy doesn't mean that I'm sinless. Worthy means that I'm fighting the battle. 
I'm fighting my addiction. I'm fighting and I'm genuinely repenting by doing my canon, my rule, by cutting off my relationship with my old girlfriend or my old boyfriend, by never going back to Atlantic City again, by, not, by taking all the money that, to, you know, that, that I stole, all the value of everything I stole, and put it in the church. That's what it means to be worthy. It doesn't mean that there's no, I, I'm, I'm sinless. No, there's nobody sinless. Okay? So when you're approaching Holy Communion, make sure you have those things in place. Because then you're going to be eating and drinking the body of the Lord, eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Damnation. You know what that means? Damnation? It's very harsh. Yes? I have a question about the rights of the church. When, uh, when the priest forgives someone to take the Eucharist, and let's say the person ends up dying during that period, does the church pray the funeral right on that person or not? Usually, when, when the church does that to somebody, they don't just cut them off and then just leave them. Okay? What, what is we do, we do like we have like spiritual rehabilitation. Where we actually, you know, like for example, this abortion issue thing. Hi, Mark. How are you, Doc? This abortion issue. Right? You with me? This abortion issue. Okay? If I say to this young lady, Habibti, you know, I'm going to have to just ask you to refrain for just maybe six months, a year. Abuna, I didn't know. It dep it, it's different. If I knew, if she knew, if her husband, are, are they servants? Are they not servants? Do they ju are they just new believers? Uh, are they, what are they? What, do they? what is there? You have to like kind of figure it out. So anyway, so that person, I just don't say no communion and then leave them. No, I call them. I tell them to come attend the church. I make sure they're praying, they're reading their Bibles. And after a while, after a while, then, you know, we can keep, we can keep tracks, track on them and we can maybe help them to, a, to repent a little bit quicker and faster. So my point is the church keeps an eye on th these people. And I, I, um, there was this guy in our congregation who was, uh, who was forbidden to take communion by the bishops. Okay? It. He went to the hospital. He was about to die. I called up Abuna Bram. I said, Abuna, he's going to die. I'm going to go give him communion. The church canons say that I could break it. As, as long as he's on his deathbed, I can give him communion. So he said, yes, Abuna, you're right. Take the communion and run. So I did. Okay, so did I break it? No, I didn't break it. I kept my eye on him. So we break that on the moment or when we know that they're close to death. Okay, but we don't do this a lot. This is, this is very extreme. It's a very like extreme, unless the person is just like, you know what, I'm sinning and I don't care. You know what, do whatever you want. That, that then, then I got to stop you. Okay, then I have to, I'm the keeper, the bishop, the priest is the keeper of the sacrament. When I was ordained like anybody else and I took I did my first liturgy. After my first liturgy, I stood in front of M. Bipshoi's body. They gave me a Bible. I put my hand on the Bible. And he, the monk, this old monk, was looking at me, and he was pointing his finger at me, yelling almost. And he was saying all of these commandments. You are a priest of God. You are the steward of the mysteries of God. If you give communion to somebody who you know is unworthy, then his blood will be on yours. You, do, you have to remember that one crumb, one piece of this body that you have is worth more than the entire universe. Come and ah, da, 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 I started crying. The other priest, he was laughing at me. We, you know, we were friends, same ordination. He's like, I can take this. He gets up there, he balls too. <laughs> the Saidi. We had, we had three, three Saeed, Saeedi priests. They were like this, one was like this big, really, literally. One was like this big, and one was like that big. Okay? <laughs> Abuna Ayyub, Abuna Athanasius, Abuna Dawood. Okay? I love Abuna Dawood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Abuna Dawood. I could go like this to Abuna Dawood, even with his M on. <laughs> Just kidding. So, so uh, it, they, they, they got up, to, they were crying too. It's, like, it's just so, like, people don't understand what God wants from us. And so they think that when we do this, 
it's like an abuse of power. It's not an abuse of power. You think, think I'm in this, in this to, to keep a person away from God? No, I'm in it to pull people into God. But just like you punish your kids or you have a little brother, you have a little brother, for example, and he's constantly doing the same thing. Oh, what are you going to do? You're going to give it to him. You're gonna, you have to discipline him because then if you don't, you're going to wind up teaching him just to be a, irresponsible about it. Okay? I have a lot more to do, believe it or not. But uh, I don't know. I think I should end now. Somebody's saying yes. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> I wanted to maybe, you know, if we could hold the questions, I'll just maybe five more minutes. Yes? Is that okay? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. All right, quickly. Okay, physical work, by the way, rule of silence is another one. Okay? All right, so we'll, we'll skip that. So the three aspects are what? Contrition, affliction, satisfaction. How in the world can I get these? This is probably the most important part of this whole talk that we had tonight. This next, these next few slides. I'm going to try to run through this as quick as I can. But this is the meat of it. Okay? This was just an introduction. Okay? <laughs> How can I acquire the three aspects of repentance? The first one, I've got to confess to an experienced spiritual father. As men reveal the diseases of the body, not to any doctor, but to those who are experienced, so also the confession of sins ought to take place in the presence of those who are able to treat them. St. Basil. I have to examine my conscience. This is the big one. Sit with yourself in a quiet place. Bow your head. Judge yourself and your sins. Consider the whole span of your life like Hezekiah in the Old Testament, who said, I will ponder all my years and the bitterness of my soul. When you sit down, this is what you need to do. This is how you get contrition and affliction. Sit with yourself. Think about your whole life. Rewind your whole life. You're 18, you're 19, you're 22. How many years of that life have you lived for God? And how many has it been living for sin? How many has it been with the world? And how many of them have been with God? Weigh yourself. And I don't mean get on a scale. I mean take your heart and your mind out and weigh it in a spiritual way. Consider how many sins you committed and their types after the last confession. And ask yourself, why the heck did you do it again? Why? Remember the people with whom you sinned and the places where you sinned and diligently reflect upon these things in order to discover every one of your sins. Like the son of Sirach says, before judgment, examine yourself. Okay? Look at what St. Gregory the theologian says. Examine yourself more than your neighbor. To take an account of actions is superior to taking an account of money. For money is subject to corruption, but actions remain. Okay? Look at this one. How else can I do it? I'm still on the examining of my conscience. The end, then end with a struggle by attempting through every means to kill the sin through grief in your heart. And I forgot to put the, the to follow your spiritual rule. Okay? Um, somebody read this quick for me, just as. Somebody? Just as Hunter is not satisfied with merely finding a beast in the forest, but attempts through every means to also kill it, likewise, you should also not be satisfied with merely examining your conscience and with finding your sins. For this profits you little, but struggle to kill your sins. Imagine you have your rifle, you're out in the woods, you want venison, you want deer, you want duck, and you spot them, and you don't do anything then why hunt? Now you're hunting when you sit with yourself and you try to, 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 to look at your conscience. Okay? You've got to see what it is that's going on and then kill it. Just like a hunter. You're trying to hunt it. Okay? Consider how much you have wronged God. Through, the breaking, through breaking the law, you dishonor God in Romans. Okay? Quickly again. Again, I'm, I'm on the conscience thing. Okay? Consider how sin caused you to lose the graces which you, God has granted you in this life. This is why we don't understand. We have no clue that every time I sin, the grace of justification, the grace of adoption, the grace of God dwelling in me, 
the grace of his wisdom and knowledge is completely gone or it, it, gets, it gets suffocated. Consider how sin can cause you to lose you, the eternal blessedness of heaven. This is a big thing too. Not many people think of this. Okay? Know therefore and see, know and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that you have forsaken the Lord your God. Jeremiah. The last part of our word tonight will focus on just some quick questions. Okay? Why should I confess? To whom? How? What do I get out of confession? How often? Okay? Why? It's a divine commandment. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess your trespasses to another and pray for one another. To whom? I confess to the one who has authority to forgive me my sin. God and the priest. Okay? Here it is. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain, they are retained. Okay? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How do I confess? A careful examination after my preparation. My relationship with God. What in the world does it look like? My relationship with others and my relationship with myself. Um, you can ask yourself, probably like 500 questions in this category, about another 500 here, and about another 500 here. Okay, we don't have time, but I have, I have some, uh, I wanted to read you some of the questions, but we're not going to do that right now. It has to be, your confession has to be voluntary. It has to be with compunction. <clears throat> you have to be aware of your guilt. You have to accuse yourself. It has to be accusatory. It can't be making excuses all the time. It has to be honestly. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, Regard the priest as a spiritual father for you. Reveal to him your secrets openly. Just as a patient reveals his hidden wounds to the physician and so is healed. Okay? Without shame. Don't do it with shame. Don't worry about the shame. Because this is one of the tricks of the devil to get you not to confess. Okay? You cannot escape shame except by shame. What does that mean? Somebody give me an interpretation of that. You cannot escape shame except by shame. What is he, what is he saying? Yes, I would, your first one. Okay, that that's, could be. Huh, yes. If you don't humble yourself, God will be the one to humble you. Okay, you're, you're getting warmer. Yes, Peter. You can't escape the shame before God's coming judgment. You don't shame yourself. You know? Exactly. That's what he meant. St. John, he meant that to escape shame, you've got to be shamed. But shame here, so you escape the shame over there. And, and look what this says. Why are you ashamed, sinner? When you committed the sin, you were not ashamed. And, how, and now, when you ask that it to be taken away, are you ashamed? Oh, what madness. Do you not know that this shame which you now experience during confession is of the devil? Who, when you sin, gives you courage and shamelessness, but when you are to confess, he gives you fear and shame. Okay? All right. I think the last thing. When you confess, confess completely. Try to remember everything. And with a resolute spirit, be determined not to repeat the sin again. What do I get? Forgiveness of my sin, relief from my grief, spiritual rule and canon, advice and guidance. How often should I confess? At least once a month or how much, how much you need or what your spiritual father tells you. Why? You need to have some accountability. You need to minimize your spiritual negligence because the, the space between each confession, you kind of get negligent. If you haven't confessed in a year, two, three, chances are you're not going to remember everything that you did uh, so that you don't forget and to continue the spiritual growth. Okay? Glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you. Anybody have any questions?